Hello and welcome. In this video, we're going to take a look at the Gauss Jordan elimination method for transforming an augmented matrix into reduced row echelon form. And it's a nice algorithm that you or a computer can do. Um, computer would be way more handy, but we're going to show you how to do it by hand. Um, it's just an algorithm. So if you follow all of these steps, you'll get to reduce row echelon form. If you're creative, you might be able to get to a reduced row echelon form through some other kind of method. But it's nice to have a routine and something that you can just follow along with so you know it's sort of predictable. Now, to get into it, let's take a look at what we call pivoting around an entry in a matrix. So in this matrix, I've just got a sort of classic example of three equations and three variables here. And we know that in reduced row echelon form, what we want to typically have is, is a leading one at the very top left-hand corner. And so let's take that entry of the matrix and look at what it means to be pivoting around that. The idea here is if we want that to be a one, it's pretty easy that we can do some sort of row operation there and make that a one. Now we also want to make sure that any of the columns that have a leading one all the other entries in that column should be zeros. So we want to transform this column into our goal eventually of having a one there and two zeros. That is the idea of pivoting. So what we can do to pivot around two is starting off, let's make that two a leading one. So to pivot around the two, we're going to take this column here, two, three, and one, and we'll start off by making sure everything in this row here row one, where the pivot is, is gonna get multiplied by some sort of factor, in this case, a half, so that that entry becomes a one. We'll end up with one, three, one now. And then in order to get two zeros there, we're gonna to have to do operations on rows two and three now. And in this case, row two, we are going to subtract, we are going to take row two and replace it with row two minus three row one. In doing so, we'll guarantee that we get a zero there. In row three, we're gonna replace with row three minus only one row one, because that is also gonna give us a zero. And that is going to finish that pivot operation, leaving us with a one and a couple other zeros. So that is just the basis behind our Gauss-Jordan elimination. Gauss-Jordan elimination is really a way of making sure that you're pivoting in the correct spot as you're going through each column. All right, well, let's take a look now and see what the full algorithm actually is. Okay, our first step of Gauss-Jordan elimination is to make sure that whatever system of linear equations we have, we have properly written it in augmented matrix form. And that can involve having to move some terms from right to left or left to right so that all of our terms with one variable are lined up and that will now create a new column. And then additional columns for each additional variable depending on how many variables there are. And then a vertical bar representing our equal signs and a row or sorry, a column of constants on the far right. So making sure we've got that set up. And now we start trying to put ourselves in a position where we can get a leading one in the first row, first column. And the easiest thing to do is just interchanging rows to make sure that at least we have something that's non-zero in the first row and first column. If you have a zero in the first row and first column, there's no way that you can multiply it by anything in order to get a one. The only way you could get a one is by doing some addition of rows. But in the end, it's just very quick to quickly just exchange rows. So start with that. It's the easiest operation. Exchange rows as necessary to obtain a non-zero entry in first row, first column. Basically, in this last example, that's making sure we have something in this blue circle, like the two. And then we're going to pivot the matrix around the first row and first column. And that's going to be this idea of performing, it looks like, three row operations. Row one times a half, and then row two gets replaced with row two minus three row one. Row three gets replaced with row three minus one row one. And we end up with a nice first column. 
Now, of course, we have to compute the entries in the second, third, and fourth and remaining columns all at the same time while we're doing that pivot. But now we've got a leading one and a column of zeros below it. We continue on to the next. We try to find the next pivot by looking at trying to interchange the remaining rows so that we have a non-zero entry in the first row and second column. And notice the word remaining. We're not going to move row one anywhere else because if we do that, we've, we've kind of destroyed a part of the reduced row echelon form. So just exchanging, let's say row two and row three, just to make sure that second row, second column has a non-zero entry. And then we're gonna pivot around the second row and second column creating a staircase of just ones with zeros above and below or any other entry in the column. And then you're gonna to move to, the, of course, the third, the third column, third row, and continue until you get to reduce row echelon form. Now, just a note here, if you ever get to a column of just zeros and there's no way to get a non-zero entry where you would like to, that's okay. Sometimes, if we see in reduce row echelon form, we end up not having a pivot in every single column. But you'll just move to the next column down the chain until you get to the very last column. But it's moving from left to right across the columns and always making sure we're going down rows as we create new leading ones. Now here's a quick example. And I'm quite frequently using three equations and three variables, but keep in mind that this would still work with a, a, any given number of rows and columns. Now first of all, we need to make sure that we have a true augmented matrix which of course I've got this set up already in augmented matrix form. Then we have to make sure we have a non-zero entry in the first row and first column. And it's worthwhile to circle what you're going to be pivoting around. And then first of all, we have a two. Now we're going to do some row operations. And the first one is going to be taking row one and replacing it with one half of row one. This will result in an equivalent matrix where row two and row three are unchanged and row one is simply going to be half of all of the values. Now in this case, I'm gonna use fractions and I'll try to use fractions for as long as possible, just because fractions are going to be much more accurate than decimals in the case of fractions that turn into repeating decimals. All right, now that we've got the one in our pivot position, we just need to make sure that we clear out the rows below it and make sure that they are all zeros. Luckily, I've made this matrix so that our second row already has a zero, in the first column, but our first, our third row needs to have a zero in the first column. So row three is going to have to get replaced. Row three, we're going to have to subtract three row ones from it. And then that's gonna give us an equivalent matrix where row one and two are unaffected, but row three is going to be transformed. Now, of course, it may be useful to have a calculator that can handle fractions for you, if not, then of course you could use decimals, but you're going to have to maintain a great deal of accuracy. So looking ahead here, we need to take three minus three times one. The whole goal of this is to get a zero there. You can see that that will complete our pivot operation. But we need to go ahead and calculate the remaining entries. So in the second column, we're looking up at, up at a previous augmented matrix, zero minus three times three halves. And that is the same thing as nine halves. Zero minus nine halves gives us negative nine halves, or negative 4.5 if you wish. And then in the third column, we have negative two and we're subtracting negative three times one half. That's subtracting three halves. Negative two minus three halves, or if you wish, you could do negative two minus 1.5 for a decimal. And finally, last but not least, in the last column, we need to take row three, which has a zero, minus three times row one, which has a two. So zero minus three times two is negative six. Now at any point in time, you could always fit in your own additional row operation. And if you don't like the fractions in row three, you could just take row three and multiply everything by two or negative two to get rid of fractions there. But that wouldn't be following the actual algorithm exactly by the letter. However, I mean, if it's a legitimate row operation, feel free to do it yourself if you want to customize the results so that they're easier to look at. But we're going to continue onwards, even though we have some terrible, terrible fractions in here. Okay, taking a look at the second column, second row now, we can put another pivot position. 
And we have a minus one there, which is pretty close to being a one. We just need to change the sign of everything in that row. So we're gonna take row two and we're gonna replace it with minus one times row two. And that won't affect row one, which is good because we wanna keep that leading one and it won't affect row three. Okay, now to finish pivoting around that column, we have to clear out something from row one and something from row three. At this point in time, we can try doing two row operations at the same time. Row one is gonna get replaced with row one minus three halves of row two, while row three is gonna get replaced with row three plus nine halves of row two. And that will ensure that we have a zero everywhere else in that column. Now, even though the operations here are getting a little bit more complicated with the additional fractions, we're having fewer columns to deal with because we're moving from left to right. First column and second column should work out so we just have our pivot entries with ones and nothing else, all the remaining entries being zero. So it just becomes a little bit of work with four additional entries that we still need to compute in row one and row three. Here are all the more obvious entries. Now it may again help to have a calculator that can do fractions, or if you wish, maybe you can try using decimals here, but hopefully we're gonna eventually end up with some nicer numbers if I've got this matrix set up properly so that our answers are whole values. And here are those remaining entries all done on a calculator. And you can see we still have lots of fractions, but it's okay, we can continue on. Our next pivot entry is simply going over one more column, one more row, and how are we going to get this entry to be a 1? Well, when in doubt, just multiply by the reciprocal. 3 is going to get replaced with row 3 times a multiple of negative 2 over 25. And that actually is going to help us out even in the very last entry of the third row. Let's see what we end up with. And would you look at that? After doing that operation, row 3 is actually just going to give us the equation with the third variable, maybe it's z, is equal to 3. We've actually just managed to solve for one of the unknowns. But we still need to continue pivoting. So pivoting around there is still gonna require that we do two more row operations to row one and row two, so that we get zeros in both of the entries above that one. So try to think about what row operations you would need to use and see if you can do that so that you would just end up with zeros above the last leading one. And this is gonna get us to reduce row echelon form and our answer. Now you can hopefully just check your answer if you've been able to do this on your own and we actually get some nice solutions at the end here. If we want to call our variables let's say x, y, and z, then x is equal to 2, y is equal to negative 1, and z is equal to 3, and we're done without the need for any sort of back substitution or remaining elimination if we had been doing this as just equations. Now of course I did intentionally set this example up to end up being whole numbers, two, negative one, and three. That's not always gonna be the case. Whenever possible, I, tr I try to pick examples that will end up being nice values, and it's even better when the fractions don't get too, too complicated. And in this case, really all of the fractions were just over two. They're all just multiples of a half. So that's not terrible either. It could certainly be a lot worse, and then it becomes more of the job for a computer. So. Like I say, there is some room for creativity when trying to get to reduce row echelon form. There are ways that you might be able to avoid some fractions by doing some creative interchanging of rows. You can maybe potentially do some clever scaling of rows, but as long as you're just using those three row operations, then you'll be safe. Just in general, try to keep as close to the Gauss-Jordan elimination method as possible. It is designed to be an efficient algorithm it is kind of nicely designed so that a computer can do this quickly without ever having to worry about backtracking. It's always moving forward column by column and it's moving down row by row. There you go. I'll see you in the next video and we'll talk a little bit more about matrices in the future. Thanks for watching.